Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I usually say Happy Father's Day, but uh, <laughs> I'm kind of a one-trick pony. But uh, <laughs> uh, this is my uh, 20th time up here. <laughs> I, uh, I think it's probably time for retirement, but, <laughs> but it, uh, I uh, was really looking forward to Father's Day coming around. Uh, up until a certain point, and I, it really wasn't when I got sick and had to had to miss it. That was uh, what I'm talking about is a few weeks before that, when it was Mother's Day. And Alejandra was just wonderful. <laughs> Ali, it's, uh, it's many, many weeks later, but uh, every one of us vividly remembers how thrilled we were that day. And decorum didn't let us do what I'm going to ask people to do right now. <laughs> you stand. Let us show you the, the appreciation we have for what you gave us that day. <laughs> now there's a personal side to that. I can't tell you how many of you kind and thoughtful people came up to me afterward and said, boy, have you got a tough act of the <laughs> As if I hadn't figured it out already. <laughs> But I was prepared, at least <laughs> mentally. Long, long ago, when our children were kids, we, I put a rule in our house that we never compared when it came to, to people. <laughs> never drew comparisons. It's really a good rule. <laughs> you know, and it was brought back to me just, just last football season, just before last uh, Super Bowl, the one in Indianapolis. You remember two weeks before that when the teams were picked that would, would go to the bowl, there was a chance that the two Hartwell brothers, Jim and John, could be coaching teams in that bowl for an unprecedented thing and something very unlikely to ever happen. Well, it didn't happen that day either. <laughs> both, uh, both were defeated. In excruciating the close games, uh, the, the tough breaks right at the end decided both games, so both Harbaugh brothers were out. Well, their father, Jack, is uh, also the father of Tom, the coach, basketball coach Tom Crean's wife, Joni. A lovely woman, and, and uh, Jack is in Bloomington quite a bit. And I had breakfast with him about uh, a month ago, and he mentioned that uh, he and his wife, Jackie, had not gone to either game. They decided to uh, just sit at home in private and then watch both games, and uh, they were glad they did the way things turned out. <laughs> but he said, the, uh, as tough as that all was, the, uh, the more difficult thing was the, the week leading up when people like me were all over it for interviews and, and uh, always. Wanted to make wanted to make comparisons between Jim and John. And he said, uh, whatever comparison I make, whether to talk about uh, humor or personality or aggressiveness, any any comparison he made, one looked good, one looked bad. So he he made his own rule that there would be no he'd do no comparing and just wouldn't get into that because uh, uh, they're two individual sons who had done extremely well. He was proud of both of them and he wanted to just see how the game came out. Well. Uh, I consider Jack Harbaugh a veritable Solomon. I think the way he handled that was perfect. <laughs> so I want you to all <laughs> behave in the same fashion. <laughs> Mother's Day was Mother's Day. <laughs> we drew a slash <laughs> and we come across to now. <laughs> and, and we can remember though and thank you, Ali. Now, you have your bullets in front of you, and Alan always does such a wonderful job of re letting you know about things coming up. Uh, now there will probably be moments in the next hour when uh, 
you're looking for something to do. So if you want to pull your bulletin out then and reread re -read and make sure you didn't miss anything, hey, you won't, I won't mind a bit. That's, <laughs> I understand. Uh, uh, Julie does that a lot with me anyway. <laughs> I do want to mention one of the things in there regards the uh, back to school supply drive that, that our church participates in with the Salvation Army. There's a, a box in the North X, in the North X and there's also one downstairs. Uh, in, uh, in front of uh, Fellowship Hall for all kinds of school supplies. One of the beneficiaries of that is my daughter Jane, who's a teacher at Templeton, and uh, they, they receive uh, help on these things. These, and the kids there need the help. So uh, whatever you can do to supply those uh, boxes through this month of July leading up to the uh, distribution in August, uh, we'd certainly appreciate now Thursday night is a kind of busy one in our church. Alan, would you like to talk uh, a minute, please, about what uh, is being offered? Yes. Um, this uh, Thursday, Lauren Walker, um, who's a uh, graduate of um, uh, Jacob School of Music, is given a voice recital here. It will be at 7 o'clock, followed by a reception. Um, earlier that night is our kitchen dinner at 5 o'clock. Um, and anybody can come to that. You don't necessarily have to have theater tickets. And then uh, we'll leave the church at 6.30 uh, in Carpool to go to the uh, Shawnee Theater for their annual um, melodrama, the title of which is, what is it? So it's Zombies in, in Green County. Today's the last day you can sign up. Uh, I'll have the sign-up sheet down at the uh, script table today. And um, also, I want to remind people on the script at the table that you can get O'Charlie's cards. If you remember, O'Charlie's is giving us a whopping 15% back on every card we buy through um, July the 20th. So you can if we run out of what we have here today. You can order uh, today and pay in advance, and they'll be here next uh, Sunday. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I really only intend for the announcements, but the commercial was all right, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, Mr. Whale, do you have an announcement? Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, the session last uh, month decided that in conjunction with the partnership with First Presbyterian, First Presbyterian Church, we're going to start an IU uh, college kid, you can't call them kids anymore, uh, ministry. And it's going to be called IU Kirk, K-I-R-K, not from Kirkwood Avenue, but from the Scottish word for church. And uh, we have chosen Mihi Court, Pastor Mihi Court, who was here with us in the pulpit a few months ago to to lead that, uh, that effort. And she's here, she's gonna to talk to us a bit about it, if you don't mind. August is coming, and this is when the time, lots of IU kids start coming and, and visiting churches. So I think with the help of me here and, and all the church, all of us being ready for them, hopefully we'll be able to give, give them a house, a home here, where they can comfortably grow with us spiritually and, uh, and be around us here. So gonna have me just give us more talk about what's happening. Do you want me to just, oh, okay. <laughs> See, we had the good, the bad, and the beautiful. <laughs> good morning. Uh, my name is Mihi Kim Kort, and um, I've had the pleasure of being able to worship with you all a few times, and um, very, very excited to be a part of this joint venture uh, between the two churches to reach out to the college students um, in town. Um, we are just in planning stages right now and hoping to kick off with um, a weekly gathering, a midweek gathering um, at the Poorhouse Cafe, which is actually on Kirkwood, so we were thinking we could say IU Kirk on Good Kirkwood. Point. <laughs> with <some laughs> work. Um, and uh, always looking for any sort of support or help or suggestions, um, comments. We definitely want this to be congregational based um, and not just focused on two or three people leading the ministry but to have um, both congregations really involved in praying for the students and being a part of the students lives and, and really their community um, and their home away from home so 
Um, if you have any questions, um, I think that uh, one of the bulletins eventually or the newsletters will have my contact information, um, which will be an email address. So if you'd like to be involved as a partner um, in terms of an advisor that would participate in some of uh, the gatherings or retreats or mission trips, um, that would be amazing. I know the two churches are in the process of forming a board, a separate board, um, to help uh, provide some accountability and support to the ministry. So if you're interested in that, I'm sure if you talk to Sue Hale, he'd have more information for you as well. Um, but thank you again, and so excited, and, and ask that you would continue to pray for us and, and pray for the beginning of the school year. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's an exciting announcement. Now, I would like to tell so you, if you would like to come up and, and, and read a false uh, uh, Bible verse for me, <laughs> she spoke the last time. Yeah. She gave me the honor of, of, uh, of being your liturgist, and I paid her back by... Uh, reading the wrong chapter. <laughs> so she, she had to take it from there and wing it. But, uh, so, so if you'd like to get even, I guess it's all up to you. <laughs> but we're glad to see you back, and thank you very much. Uh, are there any other announcements? I thank you, and uh, we'll have a moment of silence before we begin our service. Almighty God, we pray for your blessing on the church in this place. You have made the faithful find salvation, and the careless be awakened. Here may the doubting find faith, and the anxious be encouraged. You have made the tempted find help, and the sorrowful comfort. Here may the weary find rest, and the strong be renewed. You have made the aged find consolation, and the young be inspired. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat>
come forward, including my child. Little <laughs> children, all the children of the world, they are precious in His life. Little children of the world. delayed on Father's Day. It's a little bit, but our Father's love never stops just on one day. And that's what we're really blessed about. One of my favorite stories in the Bible about Father's love is found in Luke, in chapter 15, and it's in verse 11 through verse, well, it's the end of the chapter, through verse 32. And it's a prodigal son. And it's about a father who had two sons. And you have a father who has two sons, don't you? Yeah. Three. Okay. <laughs> well, he probably could have another one too. <laughs> but in this story, he has two sons. And one son decides he wants to take the money and run. He wants to go and have fun and spend all this money. So he takes his father's inheritance, which is something that the father was going to give to him at a later date, but he decides he wants it now. He goes off and wanders off. The other son stays home with his father. But one day, his son comes home. And his son's not in very good shape. He's been squandering all that money. He's been spending it. He's used it foolishly. He's having to come back home. And his father could have been really mad because he wasted all that money. But what do you think that father did? Do you know what he did? He opened his arms up, and he ran to his son and hugged him and loved him. And you know what else he did? He threw him a great big party. He was so happy to have his son home. Well, the story doesn't stop there because the other son was jealous. And he was upset. But that father's love extended from the one son who was wayward and was gone to the other son who was at home. It's just an example of how much God loves us. Sometimes we may wander off, but God's always ready for us to come home. He wants us to be with him. So just remember that, that your father's love doesn't just mean when you're right here beside him. You may be at school and your father still loves you. You may be playing in a soccer game and your father still loves you. He always wants to be your father. And we have a really special father in our Lord. So just remember that. And I think there's someone I remember I chased around in this church when he was a little boy. <laughs> and he has a special father, too. I think he <laughs> Wait, are you talking about me? <laughs> Kids, we, I'd like for you to stay just a few minutes. But Sammy's got to sing for you. You know Sammy, and you'll enjoy this. So for my Father's Day gift, I chose to sing my dad's favorite him and his favorite jazz standard. <laughs> uh, his favorite hymn being Just a Closer Walk With Thee and jazz standard being Fly Me to the Moon. <laughs> When my 
my feeble life is o'er. Time for me will be no more. Guide me gently, safely o'er to thy kingdom shore, to thy shore. Just a closer walk with thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. See what spring is like on Jupiter Mars. In other words, hold my hand. In other words, darling, kiss me. Fill my heart with song. Let me sing forevermore. You are all. and the door. In other words, please be true. In other words, I love you. Fly me to the moon. Let me play among the stars. Let me see what spring is like on Jupiter. Sinatra fans, I didn't tell them that we had young friends. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to see you there, guests of Mary Louise Sipes, who is coming along very nicely too. So, 
welcome you and uh, welcome all of you uh, who are here for a rare time, but no, certainly all of you who are, are back with us. It's time for, uh, <coughs> in terms of the church, for our congregational prayer. I would want like to mention that the grandfather of uh, Claudia Valeria, against Geraldo Valeria, uh, passed away uh, over the weekend. That's why Claudia is not here today. <laughs> she is here. She is here. I'm sorry. I didn't see her. Our condolences to you and your family. Uh, are there any other uh, requests? I will lean on Fred's ears to help me because I probably won't hear you very well. <laughs> okay. Would you bow your heads then, please? Dear Lord, we thank you, as always, for many blessings. In particular, the relief that came this week after days and weeks of record heat and drought. You know better than us the particular strain that put on some people, limited means for whom the extra expense of cooling makes a difference with the extra strain and uh, cost that it brought to farmers in our state and the region. Help us to see any special ways in which we can help those particularly burdened people share their unexpected concerns. In our congregation, we come to you with many needs, knowing that none of them will be news to you. You know better than us the physical needs of our church. We ask you to make those burdened people conscious of how much we care and how much you, even in their times of testing and pain and great anxiety, how much you are giving them. We ask your particular blessings for Hilda Dyer and Ellis Watt in their convalescence and Mary Eloise Sipes as well. And for Kathleen Olds, and for those around, around her who care so much. Bless us on this day, this beautiful day. Send us out to enjoy whatever we have planned, and whatever you have planned for us. <coughs> as we one, one more time offer up to you the perfect prayer you left us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And leave us not in temptation, Deliver us from evil, for the hind is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
thank you so much for the many blessings you give us that we can share back with you, Lord. We pray that this offering may go to the furtherment of your kingdom, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, that you've given us all these blessings. It's in your name we pray. Amen. This morning I'm going to be changing up just a little bit. You want me to read First Corinthians or something else? Uh, actually, I'm to, oh, actually, I'm going to be reading this morning from the uh, the Living Bible, that version of First Corinthians 13. If I had the gift of being able to speak in other language without learning them, and could speak in every language. There is in all of heaven and earth, but didn't love others. I would only be making noise. If I had the gift of prophecy and knew all about what is going to happen in the future and knew everything about everything, but didn't love others, what good would it do? Even if I had the gift of faith so that I could speak to a mountain and make it move, I would still be worth nothing at all without love. If I gave everything I have to the poor people, and if I were burned alive for preaching the gospel, but didn't love others, it would be of no value whatever. Love is very patient and kind, never jealous or envious, never boastful or proud, never haughty or selfish or rude. Love does not demand its own way. It is not irritable or touchy. It does not hold grudges and will hardly even notice when others do it wrong. It is never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. If you love someone, you'll be loyal to him no matter what the cost. You'll always believe in him and always expect the best of him and always stand your ground in defending him. All the special gifts and powers from God will someday come to an end but love goes on forever. Someday prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and spatial knowledges, these gifts will disappear. Now we know so little, even with our spatial gifts, and the preaching of the most gifted is still so poor. But when we have been made perfect and complete, then the need for these inadequate spatial gifts will come to an end, and they will disappear. It's like this. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child does. But when I became a man, my thoughts grew far beyond those of my childhood. Now I have put away the childish things. In the same way, we can see and understand only a little about God now, as if we were peering into, at his reflection in a poor mirror. But someday we are going to see him in his completeness, face to face. Now all that I know is hazy and blurred, but then I will see everything clearly, just as clearly as God sees into my heart right now. There are three things that remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Thank you, Brad. Those of you who watched uh, Jane grow up in this church can only imagine how, uh, how proud we are, Julie and I are, of uh, Jane and Fred and, they, and what has happened within that whole family. One of the joys of this particular service for me is, is bringing them back. Now, Fred, uh, <laughs> I took, spoke in his church one time. And I mentioned that uh, Suhail had, uh, had called Fred the Grinch who stole Jane Hamill. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the pastor's wife superimposed this uh, thing in the back with, with Fred's picture in the middle of that green Grinch. And it, I, I don't have that, but boy, do I wish I did. <laughs> but Fred and his parents, John and Pat Priest, who many of you have got to know, have come back on this day. and. Uh, it's such a joy. We, we, they represent a great, great late life blessing for Julie and me, and we really, really appreciate it. 
We all came in that door this morning, as we do every Sunday morning, and we immediately felt a little cleaner because this is God's house. A little more solemn, more serene, because this is God's house. And I bet we all felt a little bit, a little warmer inside, knowing that we were going to see on this day of this week in God's house, we're going to see a lot of people that we love. Our Sunday friends, our Sunday go to meeting friends, our friends whose direct link with us is God. Each of us, of course, has other friends who also are, are an enriching part of our life. When this message was planned as a part of Father's Day, I felt the discussion of friends was timely because it reaches into an area of parenting that can be the most perplexing. The least control we have over our sons and daughters as parents, and perhaps the area where we should have the least control on their way to being their own person, involves their choice of friends. Of course it's important. It can be devastating. But it's a choice that will be and should be their own. Where we come into this as parents is understanding that whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, we set an example for them in the whole matter of choosing friends. Who do we spend time with? What do we do with our friends? The priorities we lay out for our children and who we want them to play to, to run around with. Do they see the same self demands in us? It's just one more example of how the eyes of our children are always looking. Those young minds are always learning. Not from the way we talk, from the way we live. Our choice of friends, maybe even just our sheer luck in the friendships that develop for us as with the priests for us, can be a continuation of our growth and the development. Even after we've reached a point in life where we thought our growth and development were over. I'm 75. I'm pretty much stayed in my ways now. But my talk today stems from second thoughts and reconsiderations that I had kind of forced on me in a gathering of friends that happened not long ago. I speak of a particular group of four that gets together at 11.30 every Monday morning in a rather sheltered, sound-baffling <laughs> section of the West Side Bob Evans restaurant. The other three aren't all friends of mine. One of them is my brother. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh. Well, there is a difference, <laughs> apparently. In Proverbs 17:17, 17, 17, Solomon makes a distinction. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. <laughs> <laughs> born for adversity or to cause it? I'm not sure in my case, but, which I don't mean because I do dearly love the impertinent rascal. But <laughs> anyway, in my Monday lunch group, those two friends and my brother every week combined with me to do a lot of talking. And covering a wide range of subjects. One of which recently was not IU basketball, not politics, capital punishment for murder and an alternative, solitary confinement. I've always felt that if I were the one being punished, by far the more severe of those two would be solitary confinement. Genuine solitary confinement. Long, long, unending day-to-day -day existence 
with nothing but hard, guilty memories to run through a mind that had no hope. I also saw it that way if I were the one dealing out the punishment. Solitary confinement with no hope of parole was a much tougher penalty than death. Well, my friends heard me say that, and boy did they explode. <laughs> I, I, was, I was saying it in terms of, if I were a parent, for example, of a child who was ravaged by a heinous man-beast, that's exactly the sentence I would want for him. Don't give him a quick death. Give him a lifetime of thinking about what he did. Let him rot, remembering. And that's when they came at me. <laughs> they, uh, boy, you, you're the one who's always talking about Jesus and the, and the Sermon on the Mount and, and forgiveness. And you think Jesus? We treat a human like that? One said it and they all agreed. And it, it, it unanimity prevailed against me. <laughs> all three saying the same thing. You. You, the Christian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not used to being on defense. <laughs> I was uh, taking a bit of back. Uh, holier than thou wasn't a particular position I always really wanted, but... Uh, <laughs> I prefer it to being the least holy one at the table. <laughs> it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm there as an, an unveiled hypocrite. <laughs> but uh, they, they piled it on. I said, what was Jesus' theme in the Sermon on the Mount? Wasn't it turn the other cheek? Forgive? How does that jive with what you just said? Well, my mind was worried. Not really in panic or even guilt. They they were teasing, sort of. <laughs> but uh, they also were offering a genuine challenge that I had to realize. My tongue stayed quiet for a moment. It already said too much. So, uh, <laughs> but but mine was racing. What did Jesus say on the mount or anywhere else uh, regarding murder? regarding capital punishment, regarding treatment of people who committed murder. I was pretty sure it turned the other cheek wasn't the answer. <laughs> uh, you've just lost one child, offer up another to them. No, 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 I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not anything of Jesus said. A slap on the face is not a murder. Forgiveness is quite another thing. Yes, my uh, worrying mind concluded Yes, the forgiveness part probably does apply. Even in those most horrific of circumstances. Forgive. Forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. For if you forgive men, when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not, but you are not the state which does the punishing. And the state is not who Jesus was talking to, rather to you, who therefore can let the state do your punishing for you while personally forgiving the sinner and maybe feeling guilty good at that he's getting his. No, 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 no that's, that's not, I'm, I'm getting back into dangerous territory again, but, uh, but what is in there? In the Bible, particularly in those uh, red letter words that uh, we're told are directly from Jesus. Christ's very on the road, the road map that I have chosen for myself and recommended to others. Anyone who wants to follow Jesus Christ to be Christians, to be Christians. <sighs> to answer that question, what was in there? Monks of old would have retreated to their caverns of scrolls and, and spent months and years diligently looking for whatever they could find. Today you Google. <laughs> Back at the office after work, I uh, went to Google. 
put in the key words, Jesus and murder, Jesus is capital punishment. <laughs> I can't say either Google or I came up with uh, red letter decorations, de declarations of what Jesus, who after all was the ultimate victim of government uh, imposed capital punishment, would have had done with the man beast of my imagined horror scene. The best approximation of an answer I found came from a Google reference to this publication. <laughs> with the, wall, the borderline blasphemous titles, The Bible for Dummies. <laughs> <laughs> there's a ref, the dot here, there's also a sub in the title that says, A Reference for the Rest of Us. <laughs> the co-authors are two PhDs in religious studies, uh, Jeffrey Gaghagen of uh, Boston College and Michael Homan of Xavier of Louisiana. In a chapter titled, Understanding Jesus' Sermons, they wrote, Even if Jesus never performed a single miracle, his teachings would have secured his place as one of the greatest moral philosophers who ever lived. In fact, Jesus is a moral philosopher in the true sense. He intends that his teachings be not only contemplated, but also acted upon. As Jesus himself says, he who hears my words and does not do them is like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. So what did Jesus teach? In short, a lot. It's from Jesus that we get such famous statements as turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, love your enemies, and the so-called golden rule do to others what you would want them to do to you. Bingo, I thought. Mm -hmm. Sermon on the Mount stuff. I'm, up on, I'm zeroing in. The PhDs went on. Jesus gives lectures or sermons on a variety of subjects. His most famous is the Sermon on the Mount. In parentheses, so named because in Matthew, Jesus stands on a mountain while delivering his message. And along about there, I'm thinking they really didn't have to go that far with the for dummies part. <laughs> <laughs> but, but reading on, the Sermon on the Mount is, in short, a body of moral teaching characterized by an emphasis on sincere devotion to God and a corresponding heartfelt benevolence toward others. The emphasis is on the heart, and therefore it is to the heart that Jesus directs his teachings. For example, Jesus says, you've heard it long ago, do not murder. But I say that if anyone is angry with his brother, he will be worthy of judgment. And if anyone says to his brother, empty-headed, he will be answerable to the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high court. For, but if anyone says, you fool, he will be in danger of the fire of hell. <coughs> Note the progression of Jesus' teachings, the professor said. Don't murder. Don't even remain angry. Furthermore, don't devalue others. According to Jesus, when Moses said, do not murder, he didn't only mean, try to make it through the day without killing anyone. <laughs> but he also meant, don't devalue others by thinking yourself superior to them or by harboring anger toward them. And then they cited how Jesus wraps up this part of his sermon by saying in Matthew 5, 48, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The professors say Jesus' point in asking the impossible was that he wanted people, quote, to stop comparing themselves with others because this leads to a false sense of righteousness. You can always find someone more morally challenged than you are, but everyone has room for improvement when compared to God's perfection. Now the best I could take from this regarding my capital punishment question was that those you have heard it said, but I say, comments from Jesus, kind of updating the harsh, harsh old law, did not include any passes for murder. If I'm sitting on a jury, uh, I find no instructions in there to apply the philosophy those who are without sin cast the first stone in my verdict vote. But I also found no absolution for my vindictiveness at the lunch table that day as a hypothetical 
grief-stricken parent of a child. But of course, neither I nor you would would meet the uh, would need the good doctors Gagagan and, and Holman to remember the line in his letter to Roman Christians in which Paul went beyond Jesus all the way back to the scriptures and said, do not pay anyone evil for evil. Do not take revenge, my friends, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Now with those findings behind me, I went back to my lunch group a little chastened, but feeling blessed that uh, those other three are quite moral people to be around. Maybe significantly more or than I, uh, <laughs> hypothetically. <laughs> and it, I'm serious about being grateful for even that experience. Because those friends caused me to rethink and even change, in, in a very definite sense, purify my blurted out thoughts. I'm part of a couple of them wonderfully eclectic breakfast groups too. Every bit is good at keeping me humble. <laughs> and uh, I, I feel grateful for all the friends with whom both Julie and I have been blessed. So very many of them are here in this sanctuary today. Friends, dear friends, which is where I began and where I want to end today. Because friend, is very much a word with Christian connotations. The most Christian of words, love, is a root word for friend, which gives it a claim of its own to all those things Fred read about in today's liturgy. Friendship, too, is patient and kind and does not envy or boast. It is not proud, not rude, not self-seeking, not easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs. Like love, genuine, true friendship also always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. In John 15, on the eve of his crucifixion, Christ refers to his disciples as his friends, saying, greater love hath no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. We are here today as those very friends. We are here today because Christ told us <coughs> to forsake not assembling of ourselves to support one another, to exhort one another in his name. With that, and with his command to love thy neighbor, as thyself, and with so many of his teaching parables, Jesus wove into the very core of Christianity a mankind-wide interdependence that, in the name of Christian love, transcends all elements that divide. We create so many of those, race and faith and nationality, but we can also get hung up and heatedly divided on liberal, conservative, masculine, feminine, even human relations issues that split whole religious denominations apart. Denominations formed on a bedrock of the teachings of a man who asked us, commanded us, begged us, love one another. Interdependence is a five-syllable word best understood by five other words. We need each other. As Christians, as Americans, as humans, we need each other. And the extent to which we realize that need and embrace that need and enjoy it and benefit from both giving and receiving it defines and determines how we grow as Christians. This interdependence, this incorporation of true love thy neighbor friendship exists too 
as a need, a requisite in the America we want, the world we want. Citizenship and good and constitutional government work only when rights of others are as important as rights of ourselves. Christ taught a recognition of state, <coughs> the right of government to govern, to issue coins bearing likenesses of, of its leaders and to tax the duty of the followers to give unto Caesar that which is Caesar, and unto God that which is God's. Our hearts and minds are God-given. That was always what Jesus sought to reach. And he did so better than any other any man who ever walked this earth. Or this earth's waters. <laughs> Which he did, you remember. <laughs> to get together with his friends. Each of us is sometimes negligent, and I maybe more than others, in forgetting to include among our dearest friends those who supersede such a listing, but still rank at the very top our most loved of all for family members, and the one most prone to be taken for granted, and on counter on any list of, quote, friends, our betrothed, our spouse. <laughs> Last month, when I, after 75 years of undeserved good fortune, <laughs> was finally introduced to the concept of sickness, <laughs> poor Julie. <laughs> She had to serve in roles that went way beyond charitable friendship. <laughs> Long ago, she and I took those vows involving in sickness and in health. She had found me no great bargain in health, <laughs> except as compared to the outrageous grumpiness. <laughs> and inconveniences of that uh, brand new character revealer sickness. <laughs> Boy, do I owe her now. <laughs> and I, uh, I have the feeling she can't wait to get sick enough to, uh, to get her dues back. <laughs> I hope I can reward her without such uh, provocation, but, <laughs> and I hope I can let each of you know that your prayers and your notes and your simple caring did not pass unappreciated. You, like my bad dreaming of Bob Evans' threesome, and my quick to uh, needle breakfast groups, are special, valued friends. We're about to part for another week. And as you exit, and as you go through your week, remember what we have in common. We need each other. I ask you now to stand and join me in closing this service to stay together in God's house by singing number 439 in our hymnal, in Christ, there is no east or west. <laughs>
those weekly gatherings as we go on our separate ways. Amen. Amen. Amen.